60 Minutes Rewind. The effects of the AIDS epidemic on the healthcare system are just beginning to be felt. That there's a shortage of hospital beds for people with AIDS is well known. What's not well known is that there may soon be a shortage of doctors and nurses to treat people with AIDS. The plain fact is, one out of five of the teaching hospitals in this country have reported staff members quitting for fear of contracting the virus. According to Dr. Lorraine Day, a respected surgeon and university professor, those fears are justified. For more than a year, she's waged a one-woman crusade warning healthcare workers about their risks of getting infected and attacking the medical establishment for underplaying the threat. This month, Dr. Day became the highest-ranking defector, resigning her job as Chief of Orthopedic Surgery at San Francisco General Hospital. I'm quitting because the risk is too high to continue to operate on so many patients who are either AIDS-infected or HIV-infected. You're afraid of getting AIDS? I think that's a legitimate fear. Dr. Lorraine Day is so afraid that she dons a spacesuit every time she operates. It was originally developed to protect the patient from the doctor. Dr. Day wears it to protect herself from the patient, or more specifically, from the patient's blood, which in many hospitals is now considered a toxic substance. Have you calculated your chances? Someone else just describe my risk as being 12% per year and 49% at the end of five years of turning positive for, uh, from occupational exposure. A 50% chance of getting AIDS within five years? That's what they estimate. You think that performing a hip replacement operation is high risk behavior? Certainly in an HIV positive patient or a high risk patient, it is high risk behavior. It seems to be as high risk behavior as people having anal sex. She's been called a homophobic bigot by San Francisco's gay community and hysterical scaremonger by some of her colleagues. But Lorraine Day has found an audience. She is a sought-after speaker with medical groups around the country which want to hear her message, that the medical establishment has endangered lives by underplaying the risks of on-the-job AIDS infection. Healthcare authorities have been in general saying to us as healthcare workers, don't worry, be happy, you're safe. I think that there's an excitement about Dr. Day, uh, and perhaps there's a little bit of scariness to all of this that is appealing to people, the way that people watch horror movies. Dr. John Luce is a former chief of staff at San Francisco General and one of Dr. Day's adversaries in a debate that has turned doctor against doctor at a hospital which has been in the forefront of fighting the AIDS epidemic and which has already had one nurse infected on the job. I think that having fears about HIV infection and AIDS is very appropriate. And I think any physician who doesn't have fears about getting infected is being crazy. At the same time, I think to carry the fear to the point that Dr. Day does and to try to instill, and I believe that she has instilled, fear in other people is wrong. I think that Dr. Day is an alarmist. Dr. Day is accustomed by now to being called an alarmist. And she says it usually comes from people who don't understand the operating room. Before we knew about AIDS, I would have blood all over my face and on my mask. We got blood in our eyes frequently. We get blood on our hands all the time because our gloves get torn. We change them frequently, but every surgeon has blood in their gloves in contact with their hand many times before they're aware of it. This is the first time in 40 years since the polio epidemic that doctors have had to face personal danger on a daily basis, and it's beginning to have a profound impact on the profession. Dr. Day is not alone in her fears. This is a male about late 30s. He was a single gunshot 138 special by team. In an operating room at San Francisco General, where a team of doctors was working on an emergency gunshot victim, we found everyone wearing some kind of eye protection, and the surgeon in charge, Dr. Bill Schechter, was wearing wading boots. Do you know if that blood was infected with the AIDS virus? I don't know if it was or not. I assume it was. Why do you assume it was? Uh, I assume every patient that I, uh, that I treat is infected. If I have a scratch on my foot and I'm standing in blood, we know that uh, viral transmission can occur. If any one of you gets stuck with a needle, in the middle of the night, there's a hotline to call Someone at the end of that hotline is going to give you AZT if you choose it. They're going to draw your blood. Punctures from needles, both suture and hypodermic, are the most common kind of accident with contaminated blood. 
When doctors or nurses get stuck, their blood is rushed to the lab for testing. The Centers for Disease Control places the chances of someone getting the virus from a contaminated needle at 1 in 200. A couple of my residents have been punctured with known HIV positive blood in the last couple of months. How common are needle sticks in this hospital? They're very common. I would imagine that the average house officer, by which I mean an intern or a resident in training, probably has a needle stick injury at least every couple of weeks, if not weekly. How common are needle pricks with HIV positive blood? Well, if you're an, an intern working on the medical service who's taking care of patients on the AIDS ward, all of whom by definition have AIDS, and you're getting stuck every two weeks, and if those patients make up a third, a quarter of your practice, your chances of getting stuck are very good. Our risk is one in 200 per single needle stick with AIDS blood, and it can be the first one. It doesn't take 200. And I ask you, if you came to work every day and flipped the light switch on in your office, and only one out of 200 times you were electrocuted, would you consider that low risk? The people at this hospital, for the most part, the administrators say that you are suffering essentially from what they call AIDS anxiety. Oh, well, yes, I am suffering from AIDS anxiety. I think that when, if you were faced with a fatal disease every single day when you went to work, uh, I think that you would have a certain amount of anxiety. It is appropriate. It's called survival. The story will continue after this. There are six and a half million healthcare workers in the United States, and according to the Centers for Disease Control here in Atlanta, there are only 18 documented cases of on-the-job infection. Those numbers have been used to try and persuade healthcare workers that their chances of getting the virus on the job are low. How did they come up with those figures? Did they test all 6.5 million healthcare workers? They've tested a very small percentage, probably less than 5%, and they haven't tested them themselves. You think the CDC is underplaying the threat? Absolutely. Absolutely. In fact, no one really believes the figure of 18 healthcare workers infected, including Dr. Jim Curran of the CDC. It's certainly much more than 18, uh, and probably uh, uh, much less than several hundred. Dr. Curran is in charge of the AIDS program at the Centers for Disease Control. He acknowledges that relatively few healthcare workers have been tested, but insists the documented infection rate is small. He does concede some workers face more risks than others. I think that, uh, that surgeons and people who have uh, uh, substantial amount of needle sticks and cuts uh, during surgery uh, have uh, uh, considerable potential of infection from blood-borne infections including HIV as well as hepatitis B. We asked the question uh, to Lorraine Day and she said absolutely it's high risk behavior. My chances of con contracting the AIDS virus from one needle stick are greater than they are from having anal sex or gay sex. The, yeah, they're probably about the same. You know, a needle stick from an AIDS patient versus uh, uh, one sexual contact with anal intercourse. So you're saying the risks are pretty high, significant. I think the risks are something that have to be dealt with that are significant. Most healthcare workers we spoke with were under the impression that the CDC does not consider their risks significant. And as recently as April of 1988, the CDC published a report which warned healthcare workers to be careful with blood, but also reported that the occupational risk of acquiring HIV in a healthcare setting is low. I don't think that characterizing the risk as low is accurate. I believe that the risk uh, for someone who gets a needle stick uh, is uh, a substantial one and one that should be concerned. Are you guilty of underplaying the risks uh, for I, medical workers? I don't like to, uh, to dwell on the past so much as to deal with what has to happen in the future. Uh, I don't feel any guilt, but I, I, if, if uh, someone says the risk has been minimized, whether it's been done by the CDC or by someone else, if the perception out there is misunderstanding on the part of healthcare workers of their own risk, misunderstanding of how they can minimize the risk, then it's the CDC's job and the health community's job to make them understand it. 
Lorraine Day says the best way to clear up misunderstanding is to do more testing, and not just of doctors. She is perhaps the foremost proponent in the country for testing of hospital patients. We don't have the right to, to automatically test them for HIV or AIDS, even though we have the right to test every patient for any other disease known to man without a special consent. Why do I have to take care of a patient with a concealed weapon of AIDS and not be allowed to know that that patient has a disease that can kill me, my nurses, and my staff? Is it within your rights as a doctor not to perform surgery on a patient that has the AIDS virus? Not at this hospital, because I am in a public hospital. But a doctor who is in private practice has never been forced to operate on any particular individual. Uh, a doctor can uh, refuse to take care of a patient if the patient doesn't have any insurance and he doesn't take insurance patients. Why should you force him to take care of a certain disease that he doesn't feel comfortable with? What's happened uh, to this notion, this image of the doctor treating plague, treating cholera, treating polio, putting aside self-preservation and self-interest to save his patient? Well, you've used the right word when you said image because we know historically that it was little more than an image. That in the plague years, for example, many physicians fled the towns in which they lived. And in fact, doctors were usually hired by the communities to work with the plague victims. Forget for a minute about the image. What about the Hippocratic Oath, which says, I think, uh, whatsoever house I enter, there I will go for the benefit of the sick. The Hippocratic Oath is like a lot of other oaths, I think, that people take in life from other professions, and we try to live up to them, and we don't always do so. Nowhere in the Hippocratic Oath does it say, I will commit suicide, I will take needless, uh, endanger my life needlessly for the care of my patients. I will endanger my life as long as I have the proper amount of precautions and investigation of my risk. Nobody is doing that. One of the things she thinks the CDC should be doing is to investigate the possible transmission of the virus through aerosols, a fine mist of blood and body fluids that occur when surgeons cut into bone with drills and power saws. It's one of the reasons she wears her spacesuit. The CDC says there is no factual or theoretical basis for the transmission of the virus through aerosols and places the chances at zero. There's sometimes a fine line between evangelism and demagoguery. And uh, the evangelists are important in order to change society. Uh, it's got to be done with facts. Is Dr. Day, in your mind, a, a demagogue or an evangelist? I've, uh, I've never met her. Uh, the uh, attributions would suggest a little of both. You're aware that a lot of your critics try to paint you as being hysterical on this subject. They generally don't call men hysterical. But you're aware of that, Chris. Oh, certainly. But you know, the funny thing is, they say, well, she was right with the things she was saying a year ago. But she's pretty far out on the things she's saying now. But a year ago, they said I was far out on the things I was saying a year ago. Dr. Day plans to keep talking, and at least part of her message seems to be getting through. The CDC, working with the Department of Labor, has devised a new set of guidelines for hospitals to protect their workers. And they're encouraging research into safer equipment, including gloves that can't be pierced by needles. That is all I'm asking for surgeons and other healthcare workers. Help us develop equipment, acknowledge our risk, assess our environment, train us and help us, and then we are willing to take the risk. But don't throw us to the wolves. Our lives have some importance.